we are, we're really excited to be here. Um, and also actually really impressed with the other presentations and the other tutorials um, sessions and how people are using and customizing technology already in their research. Um, so we'll be discussing today um, creating custom hardware using Arduino as a basis. But before we do, um, just to introduce ourselves, um, my name is Jacinta, I'm a, a programmer. I use uh, Python and JavaScript and I create the applications that interface with the hardware, displays the data or test servers and so on. Um, I also have a background in book publishing and media content production. Um, and on our orchard and farm in Japan, I'm starting to explore some regenerative agriculture, land restoration and soil. So, hi everyone. Uh... I'm Akiba, and I like by trade. I'm a product designer. I specialize in electronics and also uh, embedded software. And uh, yeah, and yeah, we put this together because uh, yeah, well, the conser conservation technology is actually really exciting to us. So um, together we run Freak Labs, and Freak Labs uh, develops hardware for environmental monitoring, specializing in communications and sensor networks. Um, and the applications vary. Um, they cover wildlife and conservation, but also small scale agriculture, basic and rural and remote infrastructure. Um, and the focus that we tend to try to put on the, the hardware development is that technology is a tool. Um, so what would be most appropriate for the application, for the deployment environment, and for the people that are using it and need to maintain it. So it may not be the latest or the greatest or the fastest um, technology. Um, and sometimes we kind of joke that our tagline should should be yesterday's technology for today, today's deployment. <laughs> but um, so we work on different projects. We work with um, subject matter experts, including individuals. Um, in fact, one of the projects that we worked on was um, came about through the Wild Labs community through uh, working with a researcher, where we added audio to a camera trap so that when the camera trap was triggered, it would play predator or prey sounds and you could capture the responses. And Boombox, which was the name that we gave the project with the researcher, was based on a, on a, on a paper and a prototype that had already been developed. Um, we also work with research institutes such as the International Rice Research Institute, um, uh, global orgs and NGOs such as the World Bank and UNESCO. So we, we kind of work in different capacities depending on what the project needs. So that might be proof of concept, it might be um, optimizing an existing system or deploying. So today what we'll be discussing is, um, we'll go through really briefly an overview of normal hardware development because I think that will help um, give some context for why it's often um, a bit of a challenge sometimes to customize hardware. And then we'll explore some ideas about how the wildlife and conservation researchers could create or customize your own hardware more easily um, using Arduino plus some other tools. Um, and we've um, developed the uh, uh, tutorial series um, again with, with uh, some people here at Wild Labs, Steph and Ali, um, that we'll just discuss in a bit more detail. And that's how to build a custom data logger um, with Wild Duino. So, um, so if we look at the normal hardware development, um, you'll see that there's actually teams of people. So you have teams of engineers, you have teams of um, software engineers, you have teams of testing engineers, and you have mechanical designers, and often there's an iterative process. And then you've got the manufacturing, which is its own complete process as well. Um, so there's lots of people involved, and there's specialised skills. Um, and the development time can be two years plus, um, if not longer, and it's expensive. So what that means is that when you take something off the shelf um, and you're trying to modify it, you're coming into a couple of things. You're coming into, usually it's IP protected, so you can't actually get into the innards of it to try something or access some functionality. Sometimes there's built-in limitations because um, you may not, the, the functionality for the chip, for example, may not be fully utilized because they don't think people would need it. Um, and sometimes it's uh, built for something else completely, which means that the design decisions at the beginning um, make it more difficult to then re-adapt or repurpose it um, for outdoors, for example, or for no power, for example, or if you wanted to add in um, a different kind of functionality. 
So what that means is it's difficult, it can be a headache, and it kind of can take away a little bit from what the, the focus really wants to be on, which is getting the data. So we discussed a little bit with um, some people here in the Wild Labs community, but also with um, um, Steph and, and Ellie and so on, and how could we change it? Like, how could we make it a bit more easy, easy for um, hardware to be customised specifically for research? Um, and there's a few key features that that we think would be um, need would be key. One would be open source because that actually allows you to go in and adapt things. So, for example, you could have a PIR sensor that triggers um, for some animals, but not for cold-blooded animals. So um, you could maybe replace the PIR sensor with a weight-based sensor or a radar sensor without actually having to redesign the whole. Um, the whole trap camera trap from scratch. Um, it also means you can repair and reuse um, things more easily. It would need to be standardised um, because this actually collapses the tool chain. So if you look previously at the, when we looked at the, how the normal hardware system or, or process flows, there's, there's so much. So if you've got, a, there's different chips, there's different components, you've got the right drivers, you've got the embedded software, and then you've got the application software. So if it's standardised, you just have the one. Um, you'd also need an accessible uh, learning curve. And by that, it means that whilst there's still a bit involved, you, you want to have a learning curve that people can actually um, go through without having to be so specialised or, or so broad. Um, and you want ideally build upon an existing body of work rather than trying to create something from scratch. So that's why Arduino actually fits as a as a basis in a really in a few really good key ways. It's already got a really big community and it's open source. Um, and because it's got a big community, you can have you've got people who have the knowledge and skills in the other specialised areas. So they're creating boards, they're creating peripherals, they're creating libraries and applications and tutorials to take you through and, and show you how to do it. Um, and there's also a pool of people that you can tap into to help develop a new application and or to troubleshoot um, the project that you're working on. The other thing that is the um, standardised hardware. Oh, um, so uh, one of the one I think one of the most important things uh, about Arduino is that all the hardware is standardized. So uh, essentially, you only it's uh, based on one microcontroller, and it has like a standardized connector pinout. And what that means is that you're when you uh, when you write a library, then it's essentially going to be plug and play because you know that everybody's going to be on the same page as you. Um, also, it because you have a standardized connector pinout, then you're able to create uh, add-on boards, which you know are going to work with your hardware. And that's a huge thing because in using the Arduino, then you can plug into like this large ecosystem of pre-existing boards. So uh, there's not really a lot of uh, reinventing reinventing the wheel, I think, in in many cases. Um, the Arduino IDE, I think, is probably one of the biggest innovations that Arduino had created. Now, and and um, it's it's really interesting because when I originally started doing embedded software, like uh, programming these devices, then the tool chain was probably one of the most difficult things to set up. Um, it 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 was really long. It was really involved. You had to buy like really expensive uh, emulators and things like that. And right now with the Arduino, uh, with the Arduino uh, IDE, then you just down, it's a free download, it's multi-platform, and it includes like the compiler, the build system, uh, the uh, a one-click download into the platform, and also a serial terminal. And along with that, then you can like manage your libraries and the board manager. So it makes things so much easier, and that's what allowed it to be kind of really accessible to people that weren't professional engineers. Um, along with that, I think one of the huge benefits of Arduino is the library of available software. Um, 
because in embedded embedded development, what you end up spending all your time on is writing software, like writing drivers. So like adding a new chip is a huge decision because like, oh crap, I'm gonna need to spend like five months writing the driver for this chip. Like even even um like I had to write a FAT32 file system a long time ago and it took like three or four months. Whereas today you just use like um the SD SD fat library and then it's already there. So it's a huge, huge benefit. And that's one of the big reasons why uh, we think Arduino would be a really good um, platform for conservation technology. Having said that, there are limitations. And two of the biggest limitations with Arduino is that it's geared towards rapid prototype or development, development um, versus a long-term deployment. Um, so it's not designed to last in the field. Um, it also focuses on hobbyists versus research or industrial applications. So for wildlife and conservation researchers, this is a huge limitation. So what else would we need to add on top of this base platform um, if we were going to use Arduino? Um, and part of the, the skill set and the learning curve would be to learn how to optimize for power and reliability um, in terms of the software for the hardware. Um, it would be learning how to source waterproof enclosures, adaptable um, mechanicals so that you can actually drill holes where you need to, to attach it to wherever it needs to go. And, and I think um, in Nigel's presentation a bit earlier, he brought up a, quite a few ways that he had been able to modify enclosures, but also try and protect them from animals and so on. Um, the other thing that would be really important is to go through the pilot and the testing process so that you know that the custom hardware that you develop is actually going to last in the field. And then once you're in the field, um, are you prepared or do you understand how to troubleshoot and how would you repair um, the boards once you're miles away from <laughs> your 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 labs oh, and your research hor facilities. Horrible feeling, horrible feeling. <laughs> if you're not prepared, yeah. So um, one of the things we, we started talking about, this is all great in theory, but what it, would it actually look like? And so we started to think of ideas and ways that we could take people, um, researchers, through the complete process, um, starting really simple, um, and so what we came up with was some ideas to um, build, custom, uh, build a custom data logger um, using a, a board called the Wild Logger. Um, and the idea and the goal of the tutorials is, is to get people more familiar with what the Arduino platform, the hardware, the IDE, um, some of the code, and to get familiar with what happens after you've got your prototype and how you would get it to deployment ready. Um, and this is something that we're, we're talking about with um, sort of Steph and Ellie and some other people at the Wild Labs community. Um, so this is this is the hardware that we put together for this uh, uh, course. And actually, because we're putting together a like currently like we're we're putting together a five part video series on how you would take a device and essentially kind of customize it and have it be something that's deployable in the field. And actually to do that, then we had to design um, a custom board because we needed to harden it up a bit. So we needed to like, uh, we need we need to have it be power optimized. It needed to fit into a weatherproof enclosure. Um, it needed to be ready to run on batteries, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, but this is this is the kit that we put together um, and this is the actual board. And um, we've we've maintained the Arduino, uh, like, well, we we've we've taken the Arduino hardware. We've had to make some slight modifications to it in order to um, to get to a system that's deployable. And I think um, one of the big things was on power optimi optimization, which like, so the power supply had to be completely redesigned because the idea, the idea is that it lasts for a few months on a set of batteries. Um, but also we had, we added like a dedicated PIR motion sensor um, socket, some extra, like, like two additional sensor sockets and um, a real time clock for time stamping SD card. 
Um, and also one of the big things is we had to change the microcontroller is still Arduino compatible, but we needed more memory in order to uh, run the FAT file system in order to access, uh, in order to use the SD card. So, and this is what the final system would look like. So it's it, it's targeted towards a, uh, a weatherproof enclosure. It's uh, IP65, if you know the ingress protection ratings. Um, like, and it, ha it it has all the components in order to um, uh, in order to uh, sense and log data. And and truthfully, like the the point, although you can sense and log data, the real point is really to go through the whole process of creating a system, like setting up the libraries, writing the application, modifying it, and all and getting it to the point where it's deployable and also maintainable in the field. And I think that's the real point of this whole exercise. And so the I, the idea is that the video series would be something that, um, depending on how deep you also want to go, um, you can pick and choose elements that would be most relevant to where and what you would want to do. Some of the things that, that um, we'll be covering include translating what you want to do or what your application wants to do into a scope or tech specs for hardware and software. So that you can, if you're not interested in doing it yourself necessarily, you can have conversations with an engineer to um, set some parameters around how a custom hardware might be developed. Um, we'd also look at things like um, choosing the appropriate sensors and enclosures, connectors, all the kind of um, peripherals there for the design goals and for the environment. So that might be form factor, for example, um, or how big or how it gets attached to whatever it needs to get attached to. Um, and what kind of environment, how moist it will be, um, if it's going to be um, very sunny, you know, that kind of thing. Um, we go through enclosure types, as Akiba mentioned, because mechanicals are often the first thing to fail in the field. So if it's it's the first thing to fail, but it's often like, the last thing to be thought about. 95%, <laughs> no, 95% in my experience. Well, once you've gone through the pilot and the testing and you've verified the functional um, stability of it, it's usually the mechanicals that are going to break down. Um, so, it's, so it's really important to be thinking about that right from the beginning and, and almost designing around that um, and ways that you can maintain the integrity. Um, we'll also be, cover, be covering the design stack so that you at least have an overview or understanding of how the hardware and components and drivers and libraries and all these terms actually integrate, um, setting up the hardware and application environment so it's set up ready for programming, writing the application, um, and then going through optimization for the power and reliability. So that would include things like writing the watchdog timer, the brownout reset, you know, power management. Um, I think oh. the next slide. When you... Oh, okay. Actually, I'd like to add one thing on this one, which is that I think like especially on the hardware once you understand how it's how hardware is put together actually like for every device all the building blocks are the same so it'll also set you up so that you can reverse engineer other devices when you actually have to modify an off the shelf device but um we will also go through um assembling so um assembly or building the devices um uh, showing like crimping cables and and how ways that you might um, consider modifying enclo enclosures. Yeah, um, I'd I'd also like to add that um, probably one of the one of the things that has improved like reliability and usability the most for me is crimping cables and creating cable harnesses because it makes things so much easier for people to uh, to use and also. Um, makes it much more reliability to have automatic mating and locking. Um, so we'll then also go through how you'd set up um, controlled test pilots and deployments to make sure that you're confident in the hardware that you've put together um, or that you've got. And then, as we said, some debugging in the field, sort of tips and tricks that, um, that we found to be really <laughs> useful. Um, <laughs> And finally, one of the key things that goes with that is what would a field kit look like for hardware repair? Um, and so it, 
we'd go through sort of some of the the key tools that would be good to have with you at least at back at base camp or, or wherever sort of your your um, field lab might be um, some that you might need with you if you're if you're traveling a couple of days away and so on to, to reach or a couple of hours to reach um, wherever the devices are um, well and some of the components or the resistors that you might want to keep with you because it's hard to source um, wherever you are and things like taking extra boards so you can swap it out and then go back and actually repair ideally um, closer to the deployment area. Um, so that's kind of the idea <laughs> and, uh, and the, the structure <laughs> that we've put together. Um, and and actually, I think actually what, what would be really um, interesting is, yeah, to open it up to some discussion and um, questions. Yeah. Um, also, I think uh, for this talk, it's, we're because like all all of the technical detail will be in the video series because i think um when we it, it's really difficult to add uh detail into into like a talk like this normally when we run workshops they'd be multi-day and um so i think so this this talk like mainly i think our our purpose was to kind of introduce things and kind of go over what like the series is going to be about. So. Awesome. Um, there's been quite a lively discussion, but um, okay, everyone, just as per usual, just either drop your questions in the chat or drop them into the data wrapper um, uh, page. Um, the first question is from Maxine. Um, Should I stop sharing? Then, uh, yeah. Probably, yes. Oh, okay. So Carly okay. did love the fact that it was a rough lemur. Am I right, Carly? Yes. Okay. Can <laughs> I I don't want you to take it away because that's my study species. Exactly. <laughs> Black and white rough lemurs. I refer to them as tree pandas. I can spend weeks on end talking about their awesomeness and I am just through the moon that that is what you have chosen for your final slide. Thank you. I'm done now. We had a lot of fun going through the pictures for this for the slides. It was hours and hours of, of fun. Um, Carly, did you have any questions while you're on? I know you're chatting, uh, no, chatting. No, no. I mean, well, I have. I mean, my question would be what any of the words that you said in the past 20 minutes mean. Um, but mostly I just wanted to talk about lemurs. So <laughs> carry on. <laughs> Which actually makes me, before I get onto the question questions, I wonder if there, and Carly, you might be able to help answer that. I wonder if there's like actually um, a, like some, pre-reading or like pre-glossary of terms or like getting conservationists up to speed that oh. that might be necessary even before we get to your tutorial series? I, I think one of the things that um, we, we, we will do is actually have a cheat sheet and a, of a glossary because I think, and we were talking about this just before, um, that there is a lot of terminology, but actually the, the concepts are pretty straightforward. Um, it's just that there's jargon and, and that sort of stuff so it's not you don't need to learn a whole new language <laughs> yeah. it's it's very similar to when we uh started working on the conservation project and then we just kept on hearing like ungulates and <laughs> you know, and things like what, what's an what's an ungulate what's an ungulate so <laughs> <laughs> it's um yeah it's it's two different languages but Cool. Oh, okay. Let's let's uh, we might come back to kind of the discussion. But firstly, Maxine was asking, um, can Arduino be used on audio moths to hold a trained model for audio ID? Um, that sounds like machine learning, and um, it's. I don't think it's powerful enough to do it unless it's a very simple uh, model or it's run very slowly. Um, I think that like, uh, and also probably the audio moth may need a lot of um, software modification in order to kind of uh, create the software hooks to do something like that. So. Yes, yeah, so Carly's just jumped in um, and Maxine, have a look at our first tutorial in this season because that was Dan from Edge Impulse and I know Edge Impulse are working with audio moth. Um, Alex has said that they're working together to do that sort of work. So. Um, We'll drop a link in for you to find out more. Um, next is Inika. Do you want to jump in? 
Oh, I loved your talk last week, by the way. <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I um, well, the reason why I'm asking my question is uh, I'm curious when someone would use Raspberry Pi versus Arduino, because I know one of my colleagues has used Raspberry Pi in the past, um, but I'm very unaware of like both platforms, really. So I'm kind of curious, like, how do they differ? And, and like, is there a reason why you're recommending Arduino, for example, now? So yeah, any more information about that would be cool. And uh, thanks for the tutorial so far. It's it's really cool. <laughs> oh, okay. oh, I'm I'm glad you liked it. Um, is is it okay if I take this one, Jacinta? Yeah, go for it. Um, I think so. Like a uh, Raspberry Pi is actually quite powerful, and it can run an operating system like Linux, which makes uh people that are really comfortable with Linux, um, like they're able to do a lot because basically it's like a, a small computer. The problem comes in if you're uh, if you need to run something that's kind of that needs to be low power, like in, with constrained resources. So like 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 low power, single set of batteries, remote area, and then like needs to last for weeks or months. Then the Raspberry Pi would be really difficult because it's not optimized for power. So you would have to have huge batteries for something like that, even though it's like a small board. But otherwise, like if you have like kind of a large power supply, then um, and you're familiar with uh, Linux or comfortable on Linux, then um, actually Raspberry Pi is a really uh, useful system. Cool. Thanks. That's really helpful. Um, okay, Karthik, who doesn't have a mic, asks, how durable is the mentioned waterproof case? Waterproofing case. Uh, would you suggest other cases for using them in aquatic environments to a depth of 10 meters, more or less? Um, I think, like for that, then you'd have to look at uh, the IP. the The IP rating is a standardized uh, rating. It's called the ingress, like ingress protection. So it's not like IP protocol, but um, like so the so these ones are 60, like IP 65, and then um, let's see. Actually, can I share really quick? Uh, let me see if I go. If you can see this, uh, oh. so if you look at this slide, then you see the IP rating. So six is the highest for the first digit, which is like dust type. So like no no ingress of uh, dust or small particulates. And then um, and then for the water rating, what you would want instead of a 65 rating, which is like um, which is essentially like water tight, but not necessarily like waterproof. So like you wouldn't want to submerge, uh, submerge it for prolonged periods of time, and then this, and then so IP67 is submerged like 30 minutes, submerged at a depth of one meter. IP68 is uh, submerged for long periods at a depth of three meters, and if it's just going to be underwater, you might have to do like kind of take an IP68 case and and do additional work on it. Okay. Uh, I think Josh's um, question, next question, is also related. Um, how do you do in-house IP testing for modified cases? So, E.g., I cut a hole in the case. How good is it now? How good is its waterproofing? And how about drop testing? Oh, uh, okay. Like, so if if you cut a hole in the case, I recommend because we're gonna go through like uh, cable glands. Actually, oh, I'm gonna share again because this is actually really useful. Because what you want to do is if you cut a hole, you'd actually like if you're using like some kind of waterproof case and you want to maintain kind of the integrity of the case, then you'd want to run your cables through what's called a cable gland. And the cable gland is essentially a gasket that you can tighten and make smaller. So it'll form, it'll form fit a set of cables and pr create a waterproof seal around it. And that's one of the things that we're going to talk about is really, because those kind of questions are actually like um, what kill, what kill a deployed project. So like, you know, you could have like the most amazing algorithm in the world, but then if it's not like watertight or something, you're going to get like a bunch of ants that suddenly make it their home. And so. Uh, and then the other thing you can do is once you've done that, you can actually set up your own cert within limits um, test that you could do, whether it's kind of pushing yeah. it down in the bath or something or uh, depending on, on the depth and so on, but you can actually test the, um, integrity of, of the 
uh, modifications that you've made in that way. Okay. Also, sorry, I didn't realize it, but I wasn't sharing. So uh, I wasn't sharing. But like you can see on this slide that um, that these are the uh, these are the cable like the bottom left is the cable gland. And then also there are uh, IP68 connectors that you can use if you need to attach cables directly to the enclosure. Okay. Interesting. Okay. No one has mics today. What's going on, guys? Um, right. Case. <laughs> uh, Carlos also has a question about cases, saying that um, cases are a huge problem. Besides your standard cases, are you thinking about creating custom cases? Oh, um, not. At the moment, not really, because I think that it doesn't like depending on the uptake, a lot of it doesn't really make sense. So like actually I used to teach manufacturing at uh, MIT, uh, at MIT Media Lab. And so but Jacinta and I would also spend a lot of time in Shenzhen working with factories. And so like in order to create like a, a standard plastic case, so not even IP tested, but a standard plastic case normally costs about five to ten thousand dollars in order to create the mold and the tooling um so like and that's that's you know not including the engineer that would handle like the cad because you would need a very specific engineer to create a plastic injection mold tooling i think the other thing on that is that um one of the things that we've found and um discuss a lot is how can you how can you have access how, how close to the source can you get? So it might be actually going onto Alibaba, having a look at some of the cases that are around, testing it out. I mean, you've always got to test. So, <laughs> um, and even if, so, if something says something, you've still got to test it. But um, but there's more than there's more available in in coming from China because of the manufacturing ecosystem that's that's there that you can actually access through sites like Alibaba. Um, and that could broaden up some of the options for for, cus for enclosures. So, oh, I I probably I'll add uh, one more thing though. So I hope I didn't um, discourage you. If you decide to make an enclosure, then you can actually make lower cost plastic enclosures. Um, so instead of like, so you can you can create your tooling out of lower cost materials like. Um, like aluminum, even it won't last as long, but you you know you could save a couple thousand dollars there. Or if you want, you know, if you're only going to make like a few hundred of them, then you can actually f f like put it out to a CNC farm and just mill them out of aluminum or or magnesium or something like that. Uh, what's a CNC farm? Oh, sorry. Um, so CNC like CNC machines, you would give the you it would um cut very precise pieces out of um, like say a block of aluminum so if you look at like like kind of beautiful apple like the 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 macbooks they would have like a lot of the macbooks um have a they use the cnc and basically created the body out of like magnesium so they would just mill they would just uh essentially mill off the uh, the magnesium in order to create the a single piece body and also, um, this kind of gets back to some of the other talks that mentioned the repair culture and the maker spaces, because they may have CNC machines, so you could do up a prototype, and then you could talk to um, talk to someone, a manufacturer who specialises in the enclosures, to see, you know, can you do this? Can you adjust it? How much would it cost? It kind of depends how deep you want to go, <laughs> um, yeah. because enclosures is is a completely, it's got its own manufacturing process, its own design process. Um, yeah. Hey, Harold, did you want to jump in? I assume you have something to say relating to this. Um, hi. Um, yeah, uh, regarding uh, watertight cases, the, the two things. Um, if, you, if you need to uh, uh, have a case that is watertight to, you know, 10 meters or something like that, what I've done in the past is used uh, a PVC pipe and PVC, PVC pipe fittings, and you build yourself what is essentially a pipe bomb, but made of plastic. <laughs> And um, that's pretty, uh, that'll be good to at least 10 meters. That, that's not a problem. The only problem is that now it's a very odd shape because it looks like a pipe. Um, so you have to think a little bit about uh, what kind of stuff you want to um, put in your, uh, your, 
uh, what kind of equipment you want to fit in there. Um, actually, you can take a look at what Andrew Thaler has done with um, his uh, Open CTD. Um, he's got he, he he's built his own plastic pipe bomb, so you can do that. The other thing I wanted to mention is that if you want to just test for weatherproofness in in a regular ABS uh, weatherproof uh, 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 housing, what you can do is um, temporarily insert a just a PVC tube into one of the uh, spare uh, cable glands and just inflate it by breath. Just blow into it and uh, pour soapy water over the rest of it. So it's like testing for a for a puncture in your bicycle bicycle tire. Um, but you don't want to inflate it with a bicycle pump or anything. Just just by breath because this is a very um, you don't want to explode your housing. Basically, that's it. And that's a pretty um, that's quite a rigorous mm. test for uh, weatherproofness. So uh, that's all. And actually, that's a really good point. And and just um, building upon that, one of the things is think about the enclosures right at the beginning, because if you then need to go back and build some hardware, you can do the by form factor. What we're talking about is the shape, the size, the dimensions. So then you can say, all right, I need something that's you know long and skinny versus a rectangle. And so you're already you're already looking for a particular kind of design for your hardware. It's much easier to design hardware around an enclosure than the other way around. Yeah. And and there's been cases where we assumed a hardware enclosure and then we designed something and then the hardware enclosure doesn't work out for us. And when we change the enclosure, we have to change all the uh, circuit board, the electronics, et cetera. It's it becomes a huge headache. And also that's a that was a that was a great, that was some great advice, Harold. So I'm actually going to try that too. So. <laughs> Excellent. Um, oh, um, Harold, maybe you could drop in, um, uh, maybe you could drop in a link to um, the thing you just mentioned. Um, uh, what's his name? Um, uh, Andrew, um, Andrew Spikebomb. Yeah, I'll, I'll put that in. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so Sean, what did you just link to? Sean? Uh, it was a video on CNCing, just in case you needed to help to get to sleep at night. <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoy this mass um, education, just me specifically, but I feel like if I have a question, it might resonate with other people. Um, <laughs> love this. Anybody, feel, anybody can feel free to watch a uh, video on somebody machining a piece of metal if they like. Look, yeah, I mean, okay, I'm I'm going to check it out. I'm going to report back to you. Thank <laughs> you. Um, good. Okay, I think we have another question from Roshan, um, who's asking, uh, can infrasounds infra recorder be made using, can an infrasounds recorder be made using an Arduino platform? Sorry. What's a, what's an infrasound? Infra good question. What is an infrasound, somebody? I assume it's down in a the different spectrum elephant sound okay thank you very much that's really low right oh. <laughs> yeah it's very low thank you everyone okay. low rumbles very low frequency elephants uh -huh. thinking uh -huh. yeah uh, -huh. uh sorry so can they can they be heard in an arduino is that was that the question yes or can um, you make what can you make one no i think it's oh is it no, they want to record it. So, so can it can it pick it up? Le less than twenty hertz. Um, I th I think it should be possible. Um, within the Arduino, there like so in the Arduino, it has an an analog to digital converter, and so like you can actually and there's various uh, add-on boards that have like uh, that have microphones. So you should if it's like around twenty hertz or hundred hertz or something like that, then you should be able to pick it up. Um, the sampling frequency below. should be fast enough. Hmm? It says it's below 20 hertz. Okay, yeah, I I don't see I don't see a problem as long as it'd be okay with uh, 10 bit resolution, which I think it'd probably be. Like I think a lot of times like audio is uh, like 8 bit unless you have like kind of really high end 16 bit. But anyways, we can we can discuss like if you want also because we had our um, oh, I'm still sharing um. Uh, because we had our uh, uh, email addresses, like um. So, am I still sharing? I'm not. No, okay. no, you're not. That's oh, okay. all right. So um, we have our we had we had our email addresses that we put up, and we can put those up again. Um, 
So we'll drop them, we can drop them into the the links in the the cloud document, so it's really easy for people to find afterwards. Okay, yeah, and then just like if there's specific like questions or if you just want some advice, then let us know. Also, well, for the, oh. two questions specifically to follow on from that. Um, he's oh, asking okay. uh, what radius will it work, and then I've got a follow up as well. Do, mm -hmm. do you know what sort of radius it would pick up? Um, that would really depend on the uh, uh, the microphone because normally, so when you design a microphone, you also uh, normally design a pre preamplifier. And so the preamplifier would determine kind of the sensitivity of the microphone. So you could actually, like, depending on how good of a preamp and how big your kind of uh, microphone sensitivity area is, like, you know, like my this one is actually a fairly decent one compared to like my laptop mic. Um, then, then you could have different, like, like more range. So, okay. But it sounds fascinating. So we'd love to hear more about it. So just okay. feel free to send us an email. And Carly wants to know. Um, oh, okay, Russian. You've got. You should have brought a microphone today. Okay. Uh, asking, can it pick up only elephant and reduce other noise like bird chirps? That sounds like it's. That's a machine learning thing, right? Oh. I, it could be a machine learning thing, or it could be just a simple filter as well. So depending, like if it's twenty hertz, then you could probably filter out a lot okay. of stuff. Okay. Okay. I definitely, rec Roshan, I definitely recommend you guys, you email these guys or chat on the Wild Labs <laughs> forums because there's lots of, um, you're getting lots of advice in the chat. Carly had an, a similar question. Does it pick up uh, uh, so supersonics, which other end of the spectrum? Is that right? Oh, <laughs> uh, like actually I think because the, like, you know, the, it's really hard to get like the high sampling frequencies, and that's something that I think the audio moth does really well because they they have like it's like um I think over a hundred kilohertz sampling frequency, and so normally your resolution would be half your sampling frequency. So if you're doing a hundred kilohertz, you you should be able to just pick up fifty kilohertz. Okay, Carly, did that answer your question? Yes. Um, okay, I think that, oh, one last question from Carlos. Um, are you aware of the Sony Sprences? Did I say that right? Um, the Green Waves Gap Processor. They are low power consumption processors. Um, in the case of the Sony one, you can program it from the Arduino ID, IDE. Um, no JTAGs nor complicated things required. Um. I, th I think because we've used a lot of different platforms like um so like arm like like arm of course the avr like different like msps uh, mips um and i think the the main purpose of arduino is that it's it's really it's really simple but also there's a huge community and um a huge library of software and i think that's really the most important thing so like truthfully for embedded devices, you don't need a lot of power. Normal, like what you need is like kind of the the be able the ability to conserve power, and just having a community that you can ask questions, and that becomes really useful. So, but which so the answer is no. I haven't tried it. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Um, if no one has any final questions, um, I think we might. I think we might wrap there and um, however, uh, so firstly, oh, sorry, perfect. Um, thank you both so much for that intro. I think um, consensus, it seems to be tutorial series is going to be a lot of fun and um, definitely of interest. So for everyone who's interested, we'll, it, it'll probably go up in a, in a, we'll probably start in about a month um, and we'll keep Wild Labs updated. Akiva's and Jacinta have started a thread on Wild Labs to keep you updated about the series. So if you've got specific questions about it or things you'd like to see covered, please jump in there. Um, and we'll email our normal email list. If you're not on it, um, maybe email us so you're on oh. it. <laughs> um, but uh, we'll, we'll, it'll be up on Eventbrite and Wild Labs and on our email list. So you will hear about it. Do not worry. So we will see you back here in about a month, I think. Um, so thanks everyone. Thank
And just before, oh, Sean's offering to help. Nigel's also offered to help. Um, if anyone wants to hang around, we do normally have a normal, uh, just a, a chill out chat about conservation tech. We stop recording. Um, so feel free to hang. It's just, we'll talk tech and we'll probably talk about the series in just sort of a more casual environment. So please do hang around if you'd like, everyone's welcome. Um, but otherwise, thank you so much everyone for your enthusiasm over the full series. Um, we didn't know how doing a <laughs> weekly thing would go and it's been just so much fun from, from our perspective. It's been great to see you all here every week. And also thank you so much to Ellie who's done so much of the heavy lift yes. behind the scenes to get this to this point so well done um and thank you everyone and i'm so happy that this series turned out to be something that people were enthusiastic about and showed up for every week because when we first when i first pitched this to staff i was like i'm really afraid that only 10 people will ever <laughs> come to this series so to see the same crowd here every single week and like sticking around hours afterwards to have conversations it's made it so much fun for me so thank you everyone um, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, so thanks everyone. We'll see you in about a month and we'll please let us know if you know of anyone who should be one of our speakers next season or you have a, if you have a different series you'd like to see, like feel free to, for, to pitch it at us and we'll see what we can do because uh, we want to help with your work. Otherwise, thanks everyone. We will see you later. Um, thanks guys. Okay. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye.